You may be seated. So did you notice anything uh, kind of out of sync there with what Randy read? Yeah, we kind of skipped a whole chapter, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Well, not really. We're going to get, we're going to cover it this morning. But I wanted Randy to read that scripture because that's where we are going to end up. And that's our glorious hope. Even though we're, uh, it's a struggle to get there sometimes, that's our destiny. That's our guaranteed end. Now, we, we have three chapters here, 12, 13, and 14, and they have been described as a synopsis of everything in this book. Uh, chapter 12 starts back at the beginning. And chapter 13 is sort of the present, has a lot of the present in it. And then chapter 14 has our future in it. And we've seen this a lot, right, in the book of Revelation. Uh, we've, we've noted that where people really get in trouble trying to uh, interpret this book is when they get locked into, well, it's all present, or it's all future, or it's all past, because it's some of each. And that's, that makes it a little difficult for us sometimes. So I, I just continually remind you as I do with myself, that this is what's going on, and we just have to be cognizant of that fact. So last week we went through two cycles in kingdom history, remember? Sure you do. And we, <laughs> <laughs> and we saw, we saw the, the war that goes on uh, between Satan and God's people played out from two different perspectives. Remember, we, we looked at it from an earthly perspective, and then we looked at it from a heavenly perspective. Now this morning, John is going to take us through this great drama once again, he's going to add some details. And it, then we're going to see uh, what the end looks like. Now, you may have noticed the title of the message. It's Double Vision. And you may say, well, what's that all about? Well, we're going to, as we have seen, as we've gone through the book, that when we see something, uh, we may see that same thing again, and it may look completely different. And so we're going to be aware of those things. Or we may, you know, oftentimes in, in the book it will say, John heard, and then it'll say what he, what he saw after he heard, and then it'll say John saw, and what he sees will be completely different. You remember? Uh, he uh, heard a lion, and he saw what? A lamb. Both Jesus, right? Now, and we kind of have a grip on that because we've heard it so much that he's the lion and the lamb. But this goes on over and over again as we go through this book. And as we can sort these things out, this book of Revelation that is so mysterious and so difficult to understand becomes quite manageable for us. And it becomes something that is uh, not uh, a foreboding thing, but a very encouraging thing. We remember that it's a book of symbols which may have multiple application. So today we're going to have application to the first century because that's the folks the book was written to, right? Specifically the seven churches there in, in Asia Minor. So it has application for them. It has application for us in our present daily lives. And then of course we will see the glorious application it has for our future. We're going to continue the war that we saw started last week, and we're going to see it waged on two fronts, the physical and the spiritual, because we all struggle in both of those uh, areas, physical and spiritual. Spiritual. This is a war we are all engaged in, whether we like it or not. We may think we're sitting on the sidelines, but we are not. We're all engaged in this battle. And we will also see, as I said, the glorious, victorious end. And that's what Randy uh, read for us this morning. So let's start, and we'll start in chapter 13. I'll read the, the first ten verses for us. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its head. 
And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? That's a familiar refrain we've heard before, is it not? Okay. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in the heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb, who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is taken captive, to captive he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is the call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. Well, that's not a very pleasant uh, picture, is it? But I submit to you that in this portion we're going to find one of the most encouraging verses in the whole book. And we'll get to that in a minute. But first we see in verse 1 this beast rising out of the sea. Now that's pretty familiar to us, isn't it? Because uh, last week in chapter 12 we saw this dragon and, and the same sort of, sort of um, vernacular there. But the beast is an agent of the dragon. You look at uh, verse 2 here of chapter 13 and the and the beast that I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like a bear's, his mouth like a drag, dragon, and his great throne gave it great authority. So the dragon gives his authority to this beast. And then he describes him with this combination of animal uh, caricatures, right? Now where do those come from? Well, remember there's nothing new in the book of Revelation. So if you were to thumb back to the book of Daniel, turn to chapter 7, you'll see that Daniel has a vision. And in this vision, he sees these very uh, same creatures. He sees a lion, he sees a bear, he sees a leopard. And then he sees this great and terrible beast that's nothing from nature but kind of a, a compilation of them. And uh, I think it's one of the few places where uh, Bible theologians agree on, on a prophetic thing in that in Daniel's vision, uh, the lion represents Babylon, uh, the a bear represents Persia, and the leopard represents the Greek kingdom. And then, of course, the great and terrible beast represents Rome, okay? the Roman Empire. Now, what did all these have in common? Well, they made it a point to persecute God's people. They made it a point to persecute God's people. Now, we see, we, we saw Babylon rise and fall. And we saw the Persians rise and fall, and we've seen the Greeks rise and fall. We've seen the Romans rise and fall physically, right? Historically speaking, 400 AD pretty much marks the end of the Roman Empire, the physical Roman Empire. But the spirit of the Roman Empire goes on in that as great nations come to power, and they do rise and fall over time, one of the things they seem to have in common is at some point they persecute God's people. Now you may think, well, wait a minute. The United States is the greatest power on the earth, and it doesn't persecute God's people. Well, okay, let's say it doesn't physically. We don't have to worry most of us about being burned at the stake or firing squad showing up or any of that sort of thing. But those other empires, some of them lasted, Rome lasted 7,000 years. We've barely been around, a, you know, a couple hundred. So we've got a lot of time yet. We could go downhill fast. I don't know that we will or we won't, but it could happen. But what John is trying to point out to us here is what he keeps pointing out to us here. There are two groups of people. There are God's people and not God's people, and not God's people persecute God's people. 
Okay? And why do they do that? Remember we talked about the, the immediate cause and the proximate cause? They do that because the beast, the dragon, Satan, the, the old serpent, whatever you want to uh, characterize him as, is motivating them. And so that's what John is getting at here today. The beast here is often referred to as this dreaded who? Antichrist. Right? You remember Henry Kissinger? Some, some theologians uh, pointed the finger at him. He's the Antichrist. You remember Adolf Hitler? Same thing. He's the Antichrist. Mussolini, he's the Antichrist. And you can go on and on and on and on and on and on. So who is the Antichrist? Well, what do, you, what, what, what do we find in the book of Revelation about the Antichrist? Well, the first thing, this is a little caveat here for you, the first thing we're struck with when we read the book of Revelation to try to identify the Antichrist is the word is never there. It's not used in the book of Revelation. In fact, the term Antichrist shows up only five times in the entire Bible, and those five times it's in four verses because it's used twice in one verse. Who would you guess the author might be that uses the term? John. John. The, the term shows up in, in 1 John and 2 John. And what I want us to do is just take a minute and we're going to look at those four verses, five references, and from them... I, I want you to try to form your opinion of who, what, or so forth is the Antichrist. And we're going to find him first in John chapter 2, verse 18. Now, pay attention to tenses and things like that as we go through here. Chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. Now, we know when the last hour is, don't we? The time between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's just one of the terms we use to describe it. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Oh my, I don't think Henry Kissinger was born yet when this was written. Many Antichrists have come, therefore we know it's the last hour. Verse 20, 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Interesting. Chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess or every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming. And what? And now is in the world already. Hmm. Second John 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now from those verses, from those tenses and, and the way he refers to him, is the antichrist an individual? No, of course not. Yeah, I mean John says there are many of them and they're already in the world and, he, and he's talking in the first century. So, he uses the plural, he uses the singular, he uses the spiritual. This should not surprise us, because that's the book we're in, the book of Revelation. The Antichrist is anyone who does not confess Jesus is God. So that makes a whole lot of Antichrist running around, doesn't it? And it's not so much them, it's the spirit behind them that compels them to disbelieve. Well, 
what about this deal with Rome? What's, what's that all about? How do we know that this beast, this may be a new thought for you, is Rome? Now remember I, I said when we use the term Rome here, we're, we're not talking about limiting it to the physical Rome that existed in the first century, but the spirit that lives on today. And here's our first clue in verse 3. We're talking about the beast here. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Well, what in the world does that have to do with Rome? Well, any one of my most astute fellow morning Bible study students could tell you now because it came up if we were watching a video on the early church the last Thursday and lo and behold this comes up now not quite in these words but the, the presenter was was talking about something called the year of the four emperors and the year of the four emperors was 69 AD and what happened was Rome was strong, Rome was powerful, Rome was, if it was, you know, it was corrupt, it was cruel, it was vulgar, it was all those things, but it was powerful and it was powerful because they always had a strong central government. They had an emperor. And whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, he was in charge and you knew who was running things. All that changed in 69 AD. Nero dies in late 68. And who is his successor? Can anybody name his successor? Not unless you've wasted a lot of time like I have in these books. <laughs> he had four successors in that year. Nero dies. In 69, a guy by the name of Galba takes the throne. Well, Galba only lasted a couple of months. He's followed by another household name, Otho. You all know Emperor Otho. And, and he's followed by one that some people have heard of, a guy by the name of Attilus. Well, none of them last more than a couple of three months. So the empire is falling apart. There's no leadership. And if you're a student of history, you, you will note that that's what happens to great empires. Usually the leader dies, he leaves it to either his physical sons or to his uh, trusted generals, and they just can't pull it all together and the thing falls apart. Well, that's what's happening in Rome. Now, there is a guy by the name of Vespasian. And, but, and Vespasian has taken three legions, and he's headed to Jerusalem. He's going to put down this Jewish rebellion that's going on over there. And we all know how that turned out. But we also all know that it wasn't Vespasian that gets credit for destroying the temple, is it? No, it's a guy by the name of Titus, but Titus is Vespasian's son. And here, what, the reason Titus ended up being the one heading the army is, Vespasian got tired of all this falderaw going on back in Rome, and he says, here, you take over the war effort, I'm going to go back and take over the throne. And he did. And so you take what John's written here, and you see that the beast has this mortal wound, which is lack of leadership. But all of a sudden the wound is healed and Rome comes back together and sort of phoenix-like rises from the ash heap, ash heap of non-leadership. Well, you say that's kind of a stretch, Pastor. Well, we, we will get more evidence as we go along. Let's see what this beast does. Verses 4 through 9. They worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against those his name and his dwelling, that is, those who are in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints, to conquer them, and authority was given it over every people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. So this beast makes war on God's people. 
right? Just like we've seen before. He blasphemes God. He, he denies Christ. Are we talking about an individual? No. We're talking about a spirit that pervades those who aren't God's people. Now, some of them are very nice folks and they don't do these things overtly, but covertly they still deny Christ. Here's some good news in here. Notice we have this phrase again, 42 months. 42 months is how long? Three and a half years. God is going to limit this time that the beast is allowed to persecute the church. It is going to come to an end. Now it's a symbolic number, so we don't know exactly when, but it is going to come to an end. Could be before I finish this message. Could be 2,000 years down the road. We don't know, but we do know that it's limited. Now I told you one of the most encouraging verses in the book of Revelation is here. Have you ever speculated? Now, now I was raised in an environment where uh, all this stuff was just um, dispensationalist and, and the world's going to come to an end and those that take the mark of the beast aren't going to get into heaven and, and those that don't will. And, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time as a youngster wondering, would I or wouldn't I? What if I took the mark of the beast by accident? What, would I get to heaven? Uh, what's it going to be? Am I going to starve? Because, you know, it says here people won't be able to buy and sell and that. And was not, was not that the situation in some of the churches we looked at at the beginning of the book? They couldn't engage in commerce. Some of them lost their jobs, various things, because they wouldn't take the mark of the beast. No, because they wouldn't deny their Christianity. So what is the mark of the beast? Denying Christ. Denying Christ. Just as we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? We've read about that. The church has God's seal. Well, show me your seal. I want to see it. Can't see it, can you? Because where is it? Yeah, exactly. It's inside. See? So is the mark of the beast. It's not a physical thing. And, and some of the speculation on this is, you know, it's just really crazy. Uh, it's just nuts. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, they talk about... Now, I don't remember sermons preached on this because, believe it or not, I'm not that old. But I've read about it. You know, when Social Security first came out, sermons were preached. Jesus is coming back because Social Security number is the mark of the beast. Now, we think that's pretty funny, but they actually did that. Now, one that was in my time, I actually heard sermons preached that you want to be very cautious because now we know what the mark of the beast is. It's the barcode. And the fact that they're putting it on your grocery cans is just a step closer to they're going to be putting it on the back of your hand or your forehead or whatever. I, I actually heard sermons preached about that, you know. Craziness. But, it, I mean, it makes for great sermons, I guess, if you want to, want to do that. And, and then, uh, of course, now, one of the latest ones is, that it, it really isn't new anymore because time moves so fast, but it was implanting a chip in you. And that was going to be the, the mark of the beast, you know. Creative, but kind of silly. So what about this encouraging verse? Well, here it is. Verse 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, the beast, except, ah, an exception clause, except everyone, everyone whose name has been written before the foundation of of the world and the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Huh. So everyone whose name has not been written in the book will worship the beast. But everyone whose name has been written in the book will not worship the beast. Now when was their names written in the book? Before the foundation of the earth. Before God created the world, 
he wrote all the believers' names, I don't know that he did it physically, in a book. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your name was written in that book. And if your name's in that book, you're not going to worship the beast. It's that simple. So you can take that off the list of things for you to worry about. Just don't worry about it. That's good news. Well, what about this other beast? The beast from the earth? He looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. And, and later on, when we get to chapter 16 and chapter 19, we find this same beast showing up again, but here he's called the false prophet. Whereas the power of the first beast was overt and coercive, the influence of the second beast is covert and deceiving. The first beast that physically attacks, the second beast is more subtle. He attacks our belief system. Sort of a counterfeit John the Baptist, this guy. You remember John the Baptist with a voice crying in the wilderness? And when he saw Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And he says, The kingdom of God is where? It's at hand. It's right here. Well, this, this guy says, Behold the beast. And gets people to worship the beast. Now his message seems to be authentic. If we look at verses 13 through 15, and it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to even give breath to this image. Well, that's pretty convincing, but it's counterfeit. All of the heresies over the years that have come up in, in Christianity, the most dangerous ones are the ones that are almost true or 95% true. Why? Because they're so believable. But they have just enough error in them to lead people astray. And that's what this second beast is good at. Remember John's words? He who denies Jesus is the Christ is the Antichrist. So we're back to these symbols for just a minute. The sealing of God, the mark of the beast. And what are they? They are simply marks of ownership. That's what they are. You are either of your father the devil or you of your father God. There's no in between. Now who said that? Who would say such an outrageous thing? Anybody know? I didn't quote it exactly, but almost. Well, it was a guy by the name of Jesus. And you remember, remember in John chapter 8, verse 32, he was talking to the, to the Pharisees and debating with them. And he says, You do not believe because you are of your father the devil and your will is to do his deeds. There you go. The problem with us is we tend to think about the devil's deeds as always something uh, outwardly horrendous, like a murder or a molestation or something. Those are the devil's doing, but so is just plain unbelieving. So you are either of your father the devil or of your father God, one of the two. Well, I said we'd come back to some more information about why we believe that this second beast is, is Rome. And we come to this, this little deal that everybody's heard about, this 666, right? We, we've all heard about that. And uh, what does it say here in verse 18? This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and the number is 666. Now here we have some duality going again, don't we? Don't we? Because look what it says here. Let the one who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, 
and his number is 666. So now we're not talking about an empire, we're talking about an emperor. Well, who could it be? Here's a term that may be new to you. Can you throw that up there, Michelle? Yeah, I'm going to read you a definition. You may or may not know that. Gematria, anybody know what that means? Okay, good. We'll find out. Well, Gematria was, uh, I'm going to read you Dennis's definition because he's just a lot smarter than I am and does a better job of it. Uh, so here, here it is. This was, this was very common in the first century. Okay. In calling the beast number the number of its name and inviting the reader to calculate it, John signaled to first century readers the presence of a kind of ancient code called gematria. Since the letters of ancient alphabets also carried different numerical values, names or words could be encoded by being represented as the mathematical sum of the value of the letters they contained. To make the code harder to crack, especially in mystical or apocalyptic writing, the key name was first translated into a foreign alphabet and then its total computed in terms of the value of those foreign letters. Okay, you can unfollow that, right? Because we're all familiar with Roman numerals. Well, so what they would do is they would assign numerical value to these letters. Well, what about 666? Now, you, you notice Dennis mentioned in there that to make it more difficult to crack, they would not only put it in code, but they would put it in a different language. So you had to figure out which language it was. So uh, John's writing this in... Greek, right? And if you add it up in Greek, it doesn't mean anything. But, if you take the word beast in Hebrew and calculate the values of the letters, guess what you come up with? Six, six, six. It's the letter of the beast. Well, you said the beast would represent the Roman Empire, and then you said this represented an individual. What are you talking about? Well, there's one more little twist to our, our little drama here. If you were a Greek speaker and you wanted to talk about Nero, you would call him Nero Kaiser. Kaiser being the Greek word for emperor. You wouldn't just say Nero because that would be disrespectful. You might lose your head. So it was Nero Kaiser. Well, guess what? If you take Nero Kaiser and put it in Hebrew, add up the total value of the letters, what do you get? 666. Six, six. Very interesting. Now, to us, we say, well, well, so what? What about Nero? But if you were a first century Christian and you heard the name Nero, your knees would knock. It, it, was, it was not good news. So what John is saying, here's the thing. It's, it's headed by Nero or people like Nero, so beware. And that's what he's getting at. All of this, then, could be very depressing. Could it not? I would think it would be. Except for what Randy shared with us. Because Randy has shared with us what happens at the end. And it's quite thrilling. Then I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. There have been, they have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Wow, that's good, isn't it? I don't know. Here's the scene of the Lamb and His army. The 144,000 contrasts sharply with what immediately precedes it. The beast and his devotees, right? One is marked by purity and truth. The other is marked uh, by lies and destruction. While Christ followers, as I said, truth, purity... 
Now we know from earlier reading the 144,000 is a number that symbolizes the total number of the redeemed, of God's people, whatever that number is. I don't know, gazillion or whatever it comes out to be. So we have the picture of the church here. That's the good news, and the church is singing a new song. And if we know our Old Testament well, that term new song shows up whenever Christ's people have won a great victory. And as far as I know, the first place it shows up is Exodus chapter 15. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed victoriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Well, what's he talking about? It's Moses' song he composed on the other side of the Red Sea after God got them safely through it. And then as you go through the New Testament, you'll see they won a great victory, they sang a new song. They won a great victory, they sang a new song. So here we have the church singing a new song. Why? Because they, they, we, have become victorious over the beast and his underlings. That's good news. That's good news. And notice that only the redeemed can learn the words to this song, right? And I, when I, I was thinking about that and I thought about 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 where it, it says that the natural man does not discern the things of the God because they are spiritually appraised. And you know, you talk to people and you talk to people and you talk to people and you wonder, well, why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? Well, that's why they don't get it. Unless God redeems them, they will never get it. The only reason you and I get it is not because we're smart. It's because God and His grace and His love and His mercy redeemed us. Wrote our name in that book before the foundation of the world. That's good news. Or is it? Look at verse 4. It tells us who makes up this 144,000. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. Does this mean that the church is made up of a bunch of virgin men? That's what it says. Aha. But we're looking at a book of what? Symbols. Symbols. And what this symbolizes is simply purity. It has nothing to do with sex. Don't get off on sex. It's not a physical thing. It's all through Scripture we see uh, God's people, especially in the Old Testament, described as what? As, as a, a beautiful woman, a loving wife, a chaste virgin. And we also hear her described as a prostitute, a harlot. In other words, when she's being faithful to Christ, she's talked about one way. When she's being unfaithful to Christ, she's talked about another way. But now, remember our picture now is in heaven, it's 144,000. We're all faithful to Christ when we get to heaven. See, we're all pure in that sense. Not because of anything in us, but because we're redeemed. Well, then he goes on and he says, uh, It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Well, again, I'm in a little trouble because there have been times I've not done, I'm quite sure, what God wanted me to do. It may come as a shock to some of you, but it's true, and it's true of you also. So he's saying that these 144,000 are absolutely faithful. So they're pure and they're absolutely faithful. But we've got one more hurdle to get over here, and that's in verse 5. And in their mouths no lie was found, for they were blameless. Whew. Does that mean if you've ever told a lie, you can't go to heaven? Look up this afternoon, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. It says, all liars, not just big ones, all liars, little white liars, as well as great big black liars, will not take part in the kingdom of God. Oh, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? Well, we'll get to Revelation 21 when we get there. But what he's talking about here is, he's not talking about liars, plural, like, you know, I lied to you about I'm coming over to fix your faucet this afternoon, but I'm not gonna because I want to watch television. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the lie versus the truth. 
Okay? The lie versus the truth. You remember what John said about when to the Antichrist? He is the liar, the original liar. What, isn't Satan described as the father of lies? But he's the father of the lie. And what is the biggest lie? There is no God. Don't believe in Jesus. That's silliness. That's what he's talking about here. John chapter 8. He says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, when he says that, is he talking about a set of propositions? When he says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free? Of course not. And we have no trouble understanding what he's talking about. Who is the truth? Remember Pilate's famous question, what is truth? Well, it's an improper question. The question is, who is truth? And the truth is Jesus Christ. So these people all know the truth, and the truth is Jesus Christ, and there's no antichrist in them. You know, Peter uh, puts it this way. I, I like the way he does this in chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are in that number of 144,000. Symbolic number. Okay? Therefore, we are considered the pure virgins. We are considered the absolutely faithful. And we are considered the people of truth. Why? And it uses the, uses the word twice here in these verses. Because we're redeemed. Not because we're good. Not because we're spiritually astute. Uh, not because of any of those things that are in us. But because Jesus Christ chose to redeem us from the people of this world and set us over here in his kingdom. So the question you want to ask yourself in all of this is not... Who is the beast, or what does he look like, or when's he coming, or any of that stuff that we get so bogged down with. The question you want to ask yourself is, which group do I belong to? The people of this world, or the people of God's kingdom? Do you know the truth? And again, that's not a proposition, it's a person. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, it's a simple thing to rectify. You simply place your faith in Him as your Redeemer. You can say in the quietness of your heart, God, I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want your righteousness applied to my life. And it's in. You're in. It's a done deal. Now is the time. We've seen over and over again that we have a limited number of years here between the first and the second coming. We don't know what they are. But I think I'd want to make sure where I'm at whenever it happens. Now, as the first century church looked around its world, it didn't look like they were going to win. We've talked about that as we've come along. As we look around our world, it doesn't look like we're winning, does it? Of course not. Depending on where we live, we see the church physically persecuted. We see Christians murdered. We see Christians raped. We see churches burned. And nothing's done about it. Those of us fortunate enough to live here in the United States, we look around and we see a, a church and Christians uh, filled with apathy. And we kind of don't care. And uh, we've got all our little idolatrous things that we have set up. And I don't mean figurines sitting on the fireplace that we bow down to, but all the things that come before Jesus sometimes in our lives. And we say, it doesn't look to me like we're winning. 
We're just called to endure and to tell people about Christ. You do those two things and you got it going. The church is called to endure and tell people about Jesus Christ. And one day, whenever that day is, boom, we become a part of that great chorus in heaven. And that's going to be awesome. Uh, I'd like to describe it for you, but I don't, I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, it's just too awesome for me to get. So, but it's going to be good and it's guaranteed. Isn't that grand? Pray with me. Father, thank you for these, uh, these words. And, and Lord, we don't, uh, we don't uh, presume to understand all of your ways. Uh, we, we don't have the, the capabilities of that. And yet we see here in this book, this book of Revelation, that you have chosen your people. You've done it from before the foundation of the world. You have sealed us until the day of redemption when we pop into heaven to be with you forever and ever. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. There are many things we don't have to worry about. We don't have to concern ourselves with some of these details that have so captured the imagination of so many and, and moved them from the things that you've called them to do to uh, wasting time on some of these other things. Lord, keep us from that. And, and Lord, uh, don't allow any seed of pride to, to, to grow in us because we think we are uh, more on track than somebody else. If we are, it's only by your grace. And we appreciate that. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that now would be the time when they would say, yes, God, I want to be a part of your people and reign forever with you. And now, Lord, uh, bless our week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.